This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Welcome. You've heard and read the spin the media and the politicians have put on the issues of the day. To get the correct spin on what's going on in North Carolina, let's introduce you to our panel of experts. They include former House Speaker and former State Representative Joe Mavretic, Chris Fitzsimon from NC Policy Watch, syndicated columnist and author John Hood, and former State Senator and Chair of the State Board of Education Howard Lee. Well, as we move closer to Christmas, there's still important issues we need to discuss. This week, we're going to talk about the special sessions of the legislature that convened this week. We'll talk about new provisions with the state health plan that allow sex change surgeries and hormone therapy. And we'll talk about frequent lottery winners and why they're costing the state money. Let's get started. This week's special sessions of the General Assembly were not without controversy and mystery as lawmakers promptly passed $200 million in funding for disaster response for victims of Hurricane Matthew and the Western wildfires. Then they adjourned and called themselves back into a second special session that House Speaker Tim Moore said it would take up, quote, various items that may be of concern to members of the caucus. Democrats, as you can imagine, were incensed, but leadership said they were already in Raleigh. There was no need to wait until January. Joe, let's start at the beginning. North Carolina's got more than a billion six hundred million dollars in the so-called rainy day fund to deal with emergencies. And a lot of people say Governor McCroy didn't really need to call a special session to allocate money from those friends. Why did he do it? <laughs> Well, when this first got started, Tom, I thought, okay, this is a feel-good move. Uh, with the holiday season, there's been a lot of negative publicity about Republicans and uh, at the national level and, and it, within North Carolina. And here's a nice time for the Republican-led legislature to do some good stuff. And you start off with hurricane and wildfire relief, and, and everybody kind of feels good about it before you go home for the holidays. But the second session really makes me think about how the House ran under Democrats in 1987, where the caucus was dictated to by a few members of leadership, both on the House side and the Senate yeah, side. Yeah, you can call their names. Listen to Ramsey and, and Billy White. And, and you just, you know, you by God were going to do exactly what they said you were going to do. And if you didn't, you were going to suffer the consequences. Howard, let's, let's move to the, the specifics of the disaster response bill. Um, $66 million of that $200 million was allocated to match about $300 million in federal funds. Uh, 20 million would go to the Housing Trust Fund to help those affected by uh, Hurricane Matthew. 10 million to help local governments rebuild infrastructure. Another 10 million to help continuing cleanup efforts. And 37 million to assist in restoring nurseries and facilities damaged by fires. Uh, comment on this legislation. Was it good legislation? I think it's reasonable legislation. It certainly covers many of the areas that I think uh, need addressing and will give people some hope that there are resources out there that will begin to give them some relief. So I think it was good. I also think uh, it made sense for the governor to call a special session because, as I remember, if there was a time when the legislature had to appropriate a certain amount of money over and above a given mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. And so the governor calling it, I think, gave him the kind of cover and also sent a very powerful message across the state that, are, that is a very positive message. So I think between the two, the legislature and the governor, it was a good move. John, there were a number of people that were critical of this, saying it wasn't nearly enough. Uh, the response from legislative leadership is, well, okay, it's a good start and we'll come back in January and address it again if we need to. Is that, is that a good response? I do think that's a good response. It's reasonable. The legislature will be back in 2017. There were some projects and, and, and cleanup efforts that needed to get started earlier. Interestingly, uh, they didn't fund all of this money out of the rainy day fund. They yes. took some, part of it is funded out of, say, the state's reserve account, and part of it is to be funded out of revenue growth from the coming fiscal year, which right now looks pretty solid. Yeah, because we're ahead of uh, what's Projections projected by for the bit. year. Yeah. All right. Chris, there, were, there was also uh, codicils in here to deal with school systems, mm -hmm. uh, many of, uh, of whom or many of which down in the southeastern part of the state particularly, 
as many as three weeks uh, of missing school because of flooding that took place. Um, they gave these schools some flexibility in the required numbers of days that students had to attend in order to be able to comply with the state law. Um, again, some complaints that they didn't go far enough. What do you think? Well, I, I think the school calendar issue for some reason is the, one of the more controversial things they deal with. I don't have any huge problems with, I, I wish we could make sure that all these kids had 180 days. This was, a, I hope, a once in a lifetime experience that they'll have to endure. I think overall, I don't find a lot to object in the in the disaster relief package. It is interesting that they gave a lot of money to the Golden Leaf Foundation, which not too many years ago the Republicans wanted to abolish. They're using that as a distribution mechanism for some of this money. But as Joe said, the, the big story this week was we had a brief bipartisan moment in North Carolina when everybody thought it was a unanimous vote in the, in the House and Senate, let's help these people who need help, let's do all this, and then that was literally shattered in about an hour. It's kind of like sitting around the campfire singing kumbaya, eating s'mores. Well, and, the, and while there was another fire being lit, it destroyed all that in and, and, and one of the worst displays well, of heavy-handedness that I've seen in a long time. Let's go to that. Um, one thing, there's been a discussion for at least a decade about being able to uh, introduce a bill uh, before sessions begin to give everybody, particularly the staff, a heads up on where you have to do research and whatever. Well, the second session kind of addresses that in an oblique kind of way because what it says is a lot of bills will come in and uh, the staff has a notion about what's going to come forward early days in 2017 assembly. And so do the people out there in the press. Logistically, John, I'm, I'm wondering, why did they adjourn the first session and then call themselves back into the second session? Well, did, did any of the bills that, that Chris objects to pass in the same session that a hurricane relief bill passed? <laughs> no. That's, I guess, one of the reasons to do it. Also, it had to do with filing deadlines and well, so forth. Well, I mean, in this second session, they, they opened it up to, to people to file bills and, and had a special deadline of like 7.30 on Wednesday night. Howard, there were about 25 bills passed. I mean, there's a Christmas tree of, of measures passed here. That's what shocked uh, me. Or, or introduced, anyway. Yeah, introduced, yeah. Yeah, yeah introduced. And that, that really surprised me because I'm sitting here thinking, when has the legislature actually found an excuse to convene itself? And I can't recall a time that, that this has ever well, happened. Well, they did for HB2, HB2. HB2, yeah, the legislature. Because the governor wouldn't call them back into special. Well, that's true. Place. That's true. Or, but, but uh, Chris, one of the things that is it's becoming very obvious is uh, this legislature is going to do everything they can to take power away from this incoming governor who is of a party, not uh, of their choosing. Right. It's a, it's a little bit shocking that uh, after we heard Bob Ruto talk about the federal court sorting the will of the voters with this redistricting ruling, he literally... Uh, a week or two after saying that, is now taking powers away from the governor that was elected by all the people of North Carolina, whether he likes it or not. This is one of the one of the more outrageous things, we, literally, that we have seen in a long time. It became a feeding frenzy. It turned into a, a general assembly session that nobody knew was coming. Uh, the the the, uh, the majority filed the the petition to have the second special session several days before they had it. Didn't tell anybody. This will last a long time. I think this will be a big. Well, I was going to ask you, Joe, is, is, is no, the no. public going to even care about this or? Oh, yeah. Not, not, I think the public will care about it in a kind of a general way, but I think people who are interested in North Carolina politics and how politics are evolving in North Carolina will be extraordinarily interested in it. Because what this really does is it sets precedents that have not been set before. And when you have a special session that has no rules, for example, uh, that's an extraordinary move in, ev in evolutionary politics. And so I think people who follow it, like us, will be very, very interested in how this comes off. And we will talk next week in final detail about all of the things that were passed on our show next week. But I, this, this sets the stage for that. We thank you for watching NC Spin on the air or on YouTube. Here's a reminder, there's much more on our website, ncspin.com or NC Spin on Facebook. You'll find video footage not seen anywhere else perspective pieces from our panel, my weekly column, and you can sign up for our free weekly email newsletter, Spin Cycle. Get more balanced debate from the Old North State on ncspin.com, ncspin on uh, Facebook, or on Twitter at ncspintweets. 
When we come back after these messages, we're going to talk about the same, the, the state health plan and sex change surgeries. NC Spin will return after these messages. The slogan on our family farm is growing the next generation. It means using innovative technology to conserve water and increase yields. It embodies our passion for providing food and fiber for our neighbors near and far. It represents our desire to take care of our employees, our land, and to leave a better place for our children. Farm life isn't easy, but it's a good life, and I love what I do. I help educate and inspire visually impaired students to strive for a brighter future. I make sure visitors to the North Carolina Zoo take a walk on the wild side. And I make sure that the fuel you buy is a quality product from pipeline to pump. I support small businesses in North Carolina by matching them with hard-working, well-trained employees. I make sure the roads you drive on are safe. Scenic, the one voice speaking in support of the men and women who are making North Carolina great. We now return to NC SPAN. The state health plan recently decided it would begin covering sex change surgeries and hormone therapy. Administrators say this is being done to comply with the rules of the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, and the failure to do so could result in penalties. The state treasurer's office, the agency that administers the plan, says the new policies will become effective January 1st, but incoming state treasurer Dale Falwell wants to conduct an investigation to determine the true financial and legal implications of the decision. Howard, more than 600,000 people are covered by the state health plan. Is this, in your eyes, uh, more political correctness, or essentially is it a federal mandate? What's, what's your response to this new policy? Well, I think if the truth be told, you can assign a little of both uh, to that uh, decision. Uh, as I read the policy, uh, the directive issued by the Department of Health, it really does not require insurers to cover sex change processes. What it does is that it requires that supportive health care needs be supported and approved by the insurers. But I know there are several states like Indiana and Kentucky who've to pass similar policies to North Carolina, but then there are other states you would expect to have been on the cutting edge, like California, that have hesitated to do that. I, I think uh, if the Treasury elect takes any action, I hope it will be focused on the cost that may be related to the sex change piece, which I think is driving a lot of his, con his concerns, but not get into trying to question the supportive health activity. Well, let's talk about that, Joe, because this, this is going to cost anywhere between three hundred fifty and eight hundred thousand dollars a year additional to the state health plan and uh, according to the experts is going to require a premium increase of about one percent who's going to pay these additional costs well first of all i think uh, we ought to have some kind of agreement on what these additional costs are uh... my research indicates this that uh... there are probably around five hundred of these operations a year. And at a minimum, each one of those costs about $100,000. Well, with 50 states, then you have five for a state, what's, what would happen, or 10 for a state, what's going to happen is about a million dollars at a minimum of the cost to the health plan. And that's not the hormone therapy. No, that's right. So now the question is what do you do? What are your priorities? What could you do with a million dollars in some other area of the health plan for seniors or for children as opposed to these 10 procedures within North Carolina? Which raises again the question, John, did they really have any choice? I mean, was it a, it, it, Howard says it was not exactly a mandate that they have to do sex change surgeries. Well, the first thing I would say is that was the previous administration. There will be a new administration. The Congress in Washington is Republican. If there is a federal mandate on all the states that their state health plans have to, have to cover these surgeries, that mandate may not be around very much longer. Now, that does not settle the question because then it becomes, as Joe is getting at, the question of what is the appropriate thing for insurance to cover. Remember that for the, for the individuals who receive these surgeries and hormone therapy, for them, the argument is it's essential to their health. That's their argument. Now, you can challenge it, and there's actually you know, a fair amount of debate about the ultimate success of these inter medical interventions. 
uh, as far as the mental health right. and so forth of the people involved. There is debate about it, but at the very least, the federal government should not be mandating that states do it. If the Obama administration's directive was interpreted as a mandate, I would think that the next administration might rethink it. Well, Chris, it. comment on, on Dale Falwell's reaction to this, because as the incoming state treasurer, of course, he administers the plan. Right. There's a board of directors, but he administers the plan. Uh, what do you expect to see from this financial and legal investigation? He well, I think, yeah, I think, uh, I don't know. And I think part of him uh, is playing to his political base, that, uh, uh, which goes back to the whole HB2 issue. But I do think it's important to talk about the, the language in this mandate talks about it being medically necessary. This means a physician would be involved. Some people, it's met, they be, the physicians believe the best case is a medically necessary transition to, to, the, to the sex that they identify with. In other cases, the medical professionals say they need supportive services. They still might need hormone therapy and a lot of other things. These are human beings who are having a huge issue that their doctor believes they need they need uh, remedies, just like other people that have, Ill, uh, whether it's an illness or a condition that needs treatment, and we don't question now their, we don't question. You're, you're, I think, Chris, you're stating that properly <clears throat> until the very end. The fact is there are, in other cases, situations where doctors believe a particular therapy might work, so there are experimental therapies that insurers are not required yet to cover because there are some questions about the cost right, of benefits. But it's not experimental therapy. I agree. It's not, I agree. This is not experimental but, but Howard, therapy. one way or another, the, the state health plan is going to be under the microscope during this coming uh, 2017 legislative session. We've got an unfunded liability of, depending on your estimate, between 20 and $30 billion. Uh, we've got a, a rising cost rising deductibles for state employees and so forth like that. Um, what do you anticipate we might be seeing and how might this play into that? Well, I think uh, certainly we, somebody's going to have to go back and, and look at how do we define these procedures. Uh, elective uh, activities and medical costs to me have not legitimately been included in the health plan, but necessary costs in support of even a decision to take an elective procedure uh, should be in the plan because it's a, it's a health system that needs, uh, needs support. Tom, Tom, the other thing is that you, you must not underestimate Dale Falwell. Dale Falwell, from the very beginning of his political career, said he is a forensic accountant. And what he does better than anybody that I know is to take a hard look at why things cost what they do, and are you getting the bang for the buck that you should expect? And so I think he has sent a clear signal that this is what I'm going to be doing for four years in the Treasurer's it's office. It's going to be interesting to watch. After these messages, we're going to talk about scamming the lottery. NC Spin will return after these messages. The cost of everything has gone up dramatically over the last 75 years. With one exception, keeping electricity affordable. That's the power of your co-op membership. Learn more at TogetherWeSave.com. North Carolina's Touchstone Energy Cooperatives, looking out for you. You sleep on concrete till your body get immune to concrete. My mom got my brother and I up and said, come on, we're leaving. I became homeless in the beginning of this year. When I was about four or five years old, our house caught fire. I used to see my brother. If he see me, he'd turn and go the other direction. We did the only thing that we could think of, and we went to a Salvation Army shelter. You know, we don't have this, like, what's your background look like? We just say, what do you need? I remember the man from the Salvation Army coming down with a box of clothes. The Salvation Army officer bought my brother and I an ice cream cone. Last week, my brother walked up to me and he just started a conversation. Today I've given my life to the Salvation Army because I remember uh, what somebody did for me, my brother, and my mom over 30 years ago. The Salvation Army for me means hope. Compassion. Family. Support. We now return to NC Spin. The Charlotte Observer recently reported they had found dozens of players winning the state's education lottery so often that they've defied the odds of just being lucky. Many of these multiple winners appear to be employees of vendors who sell the tickets, but the real impact to the state is that they often resell the winning tickets to others, 
cheating the state out of an estimated $7 million in withheld taxes, since neither the winners report them or the buyers don't either. Chris, through the years, we've, to we've talked a lot about the lottery, and while we haven't always agreed with everything they've done, there's never been the hint of scamming or cheating the state out of money. What's your reaction to this story? Well, uh, my reaction is some states crack down on this and don't allow the resale of lottery tickets, and I think that's something that the Lottery Commission and the General Assembly should look at. Um, you know, the, uh, I'm not a, obviously a fan of a lot of things that the lottery uh, does. I still don't think we need it. I still think we advertise too heavily and all the rest of it, but if we're going to have it, we can't let people avoid paying the taxes they owe. We can't let it, you know, part of this is somebody will owe taxes to the government or their old child support. They don't want to have, they don't want to cash in the ticket because then they know they'll be caught, so they sell the ticket for half price to a dealer. Uh, that's a, that's exactly the kind of thing we don't need. It does, it, you know, it creates more crime. I, I think that we can we can stop this practice. And we should. Um, I, I would say that uh, for years, North Carolina and its contractors have been scamming vulnerable North Carolinians out of millions of dollars. So this is a sort of a cosmic justice. The state is now being scammed out of millions of dollars. <laughs> Yeah, but in the overall scheme of things, $7 million, is it, is it worth uh, going through a, a big exercise to... Yes, it is, because okay. even, if the, even if the numbers are not gigantic, as Chris was getting at, there are people who legitimately owe money to, for child support or for other things, and they're trying to escape their responsibilities. And the state, as bad as it already is to induce people to gamble, again, I would let people gamble in a free society. I wouldn't have the government tricking them into it. As bad as it is for the government to do that, it certainly should not also enable people to escape their financial responsibilities. Howard, in another life, you've run retail businesses. Uh, uh, the, the observer says that the way uh, some of the ways our state could improve the systems would be to make it illegal for employees to purchase tickets uh, from their employer, the outlets at which they work. Another would make it a misdemeanor to resell tickets to another party. What's your comment on that? I think that is an appropriate way to go. I, I've had concerns about uh, how people might find ways to scam the lottery. Even people who help create the lottery have found ways to, uh, to scam the lottery. So I think we should crack down on it. And uh, of course, I like the idea of employees not uh, being able to buy tickets. I've gone in and I buy the ticket once in a while because I think if you don't play, you can't win. And, and I don't, so. That is actually correct. Yeah. In both cases are true. <laughs> That's right. You do play and I you do don't play win. And I don't win. Joe, one of the problems that was uncovered is that the, the lottery uh, players have to depend on employees of the vendors to physically scan their tickets to determine whether or not they've won any things. And sometimes the employees will substitute uh, a, a winning ticket for another losing <coughs> ticket. Um, there's a suggestion we should introduce self-scanning <coughs> machines so that uh, the, the lottery buyer can actually scan his own ticket. What do you think oh, of that? Oh, I think we ought to spend 40 or 50 million dollars getting these self-scanning machines so we can eliminate that seven million dollar loss. <laughs> Come on now, <clears throat> anytime you have an operation, the scale of the, of the lottery in North Carolina, somebody's going to figure out a way to cut the corners. And if we close this door, I guarantee you somebody will open another door. But Chris, should we should we take the license? I mean, one of the one of the potential penalties here is if we find vendors with too many multiple winners and with potentials of employees uh, scamming the, the system, we can revoke their licenses. How, well, we, how, absolutely, we can, and and we should. I mean, I think part of this is that built on, unfortunately, the uh, the way the system works, the integrity of all these places all over North Carolina, and there's going to be bad apples in any system, I think we definitely should get to the bottom and, and we, not let them sell the tickets. And we, we will have to say again, in the, in the history of this lottery, this is the first time I've really remembered that there's been uh, full-scale scamming. Other or, than the idea that it's a scam on its own. Well, it, not, a big <laughs> not going there again. We did not that for years and it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> After these messages, we're going to ask the panel to tell us something we don't know. NC Spin is brought to you in part by the North Carolina Farm Bureau. The Farm Bureau and Agriculture. We keep North Carolina growing. It's a fact. Patients who receive care in the medical home from a trusted family physician reduce health care costs through prevention, early detection, and affordable management of high-cost chronic diseases. Every dollar invested in health care matters. 
Let's invest them wisely. Building on North Carolina's medical home model, better health begins with a medical home, a trusted family physician, the best return on our healthcare investment. Learn about the importance of medical homes at OurNCHealthcare.com. I help educate and inspire visually impaired students to strive for a brighter future. I make sure visitors to the North Carolina Zoo take a walk on the wild side. And I make sure that the fuel you buy is a quality product from pipeline to pump. I support small businesses in North Carolina by matching them with hard-working, well-trained employees. I make sure the roads you drive on are safe. Scenic, the one voice speaking in support of the men and women who are making North Carolina great. We now return to NC Spin. Now we come to the part that many of you tell us is our favorite part when we ask the panel to tell us something we don't know. John Hood, I'll start with you. Tom, in 2017, it may be that an election this year that we didn't pay a lot of attention to for state insurance commissioner will turn out to matter quite a bit. It's not that the Republican legislature had a hostile relationship with Wayne Goodwin, the Democrat insurance commissioner, but with Mike Causey, the Republican taking office, and potentially in Washington, then changing the Affordable Care Act in ways that might give state insurance departments more control, for example, over high risk pools as a potential alternative to the exchanges and so forth. This will put uh, Mike Causey in a significant position to influence public policy in North Carolina. Interesting. Howard Lee, tell us something we don't know. The results of the uh, program for international student assessments was released last PISA. week, PISA, yeah. and I'm disappointed that American schools are still falling behind in math, reading, and science, and um, behind such countries as Singapore and even Korea. I, I hope that uh, we will get serious at some point, and I know in North Carolina I will be talking with Governor Cooper and helping him uh, look at ways we can move this state uh, back to where it was at one time. Yeah, we're going to talk about those PISA scores on a future show because they really did not reflect well for American students. They did not. Joe Mavretti, tell us something we don't know. The most courageous elected official in North Carolina is Congressman Walter Jones from the 3rd District. For over 20 years, uh, Walter has stood by his principles in spite of a lot of pressure from politicians and his caucus, and I'm applauding for it. Chris Fitzsimon, tell me something I don't know. One of the things that sort of lost in last week's uh, crazy special session uh, frenzy at the General Assembly was uh, House Minority Leader Larry Hall announced he would not be seeking that post again in the 2017 session. That's because it's almost certain that he will be joining uh, Governor-elect Roy Cooper's cabinet, most likely as the head of Veterans Affairs. Interesting. Uh, and so a lot of people are wondering why he wouldn't be seeking re-election yeah. as minority leader. I think he's going to be moving on to a new job. Well, you've heard our spin on the issues of the day. To stay informed all during the week, give your feedback and read my weekly column, visit our website, ncspin.com, or catch NC Spin on Facebook. And join us next week for our Christmas Day program as we recap the top stories of the year and name the NC Spin Tar Heel of the Year. Until then, stay informed and watch out for the spin. Join us next week and get the spin on issues facing our state.